Hi, my name is Eric, and in this series I'm challenging myself to create my own sci-fi universe, one scratch-built model at a time. Today we'll unravel the story of Rai Jalid, a famed cave pilot. We'll find out why she's able to do this despite being blind, and learn a bit about the giant creature chasing her. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. This is the planet Aegis, and it's been 110 years since this world was overtaken by a mysterious fungal infection known as the Blight. Our journey today takes us from the boggy swamplands of Chakara to the desert region of Ankara. More on the meaning of those names later. Now, because it had been a while since I'd made a ship, I decided to do a rough sketch first. This entire concept was based on this toy tractor and my goodness was this plastic garbage. You may notice that I flipped the orientation of this tractor front to back, which is a sneaky little tactic I'm using to disguise the ship's origin of inspiration. Hey, it worked for these guys, why not me? When sketching for kitbashing projects, I'm flipping through my mental catalog of junk bits and drawing in shapes that I know I've got, rather than coming up with some outlandish design that will only lead to headaches, nightmares, PTSD, and cold sweats down the line. Speaking of sweat, one nice thing about junk plastic is the fact that it cuts like butter, and once these fenders were removed and spread over some toast, the body was sanded clean. These greebly tresses then became side skirts for the vehicle, and at this point I was becoming increasingly concerned that I'd never get a nice finish on this thing, because this plastic was literally made out of a block of cheese. Instead of building a chassis from scratch, I decided to just use the original toy frame after gluing it. It needed some modifications, of course, which I made with my miter saw. Of all the investments I've made over the last year or so building models, this $20 miter saw and box combo is near the top of my list and gets constant use. Saws can't do everything, of course, and for these types of claustrophobic cuts, a Dremel tool is the way to go. Starting with this video, I'll be putting affiliate links to these tools in the description. You won't be charged any more than the usual amount if you buy the items that way, but I do get a tiny kickback from the sale price, which helps keep these projects going. With the tractor violated beyond recognition, it was time to add this rose water spray bot. I mean this gnarly, dangerous jet engine. Oh, and a colorful baby toy donated its wheel for this engine inlet. I purchased the toy in a recent thrift store run, where a mother eyed me suspiciously as I held the bag up to the light, mumbling to myself about spaceships. If I had to guess, I'd say I have about two or three visits left there before I have to switch stores, or face a restraining order. These are sawed off Gundam leg halves, by the way, which I glued to this styrene to fill in the gaps before cutting them out. Then I attached them to the sides of the ship. Now, as I patch up some holes in the hull and go to town on the details, let's dive a bit into the lore featured in this build. As I mentioned in the intro, the dry region of Aegis, where this diorama is set, goes by the name Ankara. This character-based language is read left to right, with each word representing an idea, expressed in one or two syllables. The name Ankara, for example, is derived from the words without and water. Chakara, the region seen in the previous video, derives from the words abundant and water. Working backwards based on this idea, I've come up with the characters and definitions for the Jogari, a bird seen in a previous video, along with Ajizian words for droids, walkers, and humans. Being a pictographic language, there's a lot more here regarding the visual origins of the characters, and if you're interested, I'll be putting an article up about it on Patreon. To give these cables some added texture, I took two lengths of cheap electrical wire, wound them tightly together with this drill, and then slipped on these heat shrink sleeves. After a little blast of hot air from my heat gun, I bent the wires into shape. Next came some experimentation with the brand new material, Milliput. With a texture similar to soft polymer clay, it's great for filling cracks and hiding seams, but the advantage with Milliput is that there's no need for curing with heat. Just leave it alone for a few hours and it's hard and ready for sanding. Milliput was also used to sculpt this tiny pilot seat. And some final details like these wires and directional fins were added with wire and plastic. 
A cool thing I recently discovered is that electrical wire can be easily stripped of its casing, which then makes for an excellent small-scale hose. And this was my first time using this superglue accelerator, which greatly speeds up drying time, but unfortunately made my workspace smell like a mix between a dental office and a morgue, which yeah, aren't my two favorite places. And finally, this children's marker cap made for a perfectly scaled nose cone. For the base, I used a cheap decorative frame, also purchased from the local thrift store. I traced out the base's footprint on this dense half-inch foam, then fixed it in place with PVA glue. I then penciled in the general shape of the path I wanted and carved it out with a knife. This led to an enormous mess and lung damage and could have been avoided entirely had the foam cutting tool I ordered arrived in time for this project. And to give the ground a more realistic rocky texture, I rolled on a crumpled ball of foil, then used a blowtorch to turn it all into a delightful foam brulee. The purpose of introducing fire or heat is twofold. It helps smooth out irregularities in the foam while also sealing and hardening it, making the paint application a bit easier. To bore tiny holes into this subterranean cave, I used a ball stylus. I'll explain why later. Another brand new material for me was this 1 inch XPS foam. This is a construction material you can find in your local hardware store, but it's often used by model makers to sculpt terrain. This sculpting is typically done with a hot wire tool, but mine still hadn't arrived by this point, so I was forced to hack at it feebly with this razor knife. Once carved up and hit with a blowtorch, I also dripped on some super glue, which dissolves foam, giving the appearance of porous eroded rock. Repeating the ball stylus technique to help match this terrain to the cave floor. I then repeated all of those steps a couple more times to produce the world's most poisonous three layer cake. I then did some quick lighting tests to make sure I was on the right track for the final diorama. I also wanted a pillar in this cavern to help hide some of the diorama's guts, so I glued two sections of XPS foam together. I waited a day or so for the tacky glue to dry and then carved it up. The cave roof came last, just another block of XPS foam carved to match the shape of the rest of the cave walls, and then I blasted it with heat. Then, using this tacky glue, I put all the layers together. Because I cut all this by hand, the layers didn't really line up evenly, which was super annoying, and I'm sure a more seasoned crafter would probably have glued all the pieces together first and then carved them as one solid block, but <laughs> you know, I'm no seasoned crafter, and also, my wire cutter tool hadn't arrived yet. But at least the glue held, and as I was pulling out these toothpicks the next day, my doorbell rang, Months ago, the art supply store around the corner had this on their clearance shelf, and boy do I not blame them for wanting to rid themselves of this cursed family of miniatures, which clearly came from a farm in the uncanny valley. Just yikes. Aside from the creepy factor, the pose here was totally wrong, so I blasted this thing with a heat torch and forced it into a seated pose. The limbs were then removed, trimmed, and reattached to turn this standing child of the corn into a seated woman of the caves. The polo shirt was also not going to make the cut, so I wrapped the bare arms in tiny strips of masking tape, and finally, using Milliput, I sculpted the hair and a simple tunic. With the ship, the cave, and the pilot all built, it was time to paint, starting with my underground terrain. As I let this footage roll, it's time to dive into the lore behind this particular build. Due to the blight that overtook much of the surface of this planet, the majority of the human population relocated underground, where a vast web of tunnels and caves became their home. Assisted by their drones and droids, the humans mapped out the caves, and in time, houses, shops, and even entire cities were carved into the stone. As the decades passed, the people, who became known as the Unders, gradually adapted to their new home. 
Their children, the first generation born in the caves, never knew the light of the sun, and instead of fearing the dark, they thrived in it. Their sense of hearing took precedence over sight as they navigated the shadows using unique chirps and clicks. It was not long before this skill, known as Dwavekla, or ear sighting, combined with sport, resulting in blind races through the tunnels. More decades passed and the games evolved. Nearly a century since the arrival of the Unders, the most skilled ear sighters can race through the caves on speeders specially designed with asymmetrical hardware and chirpers, tiny devices that provide near-instant audio feedback to the racers. This rider, of course, is special, but we'll get to her shortly. It was now on to painting the speeder. The first step here was to spray paint on a gray primer. In retrospect, a dark silver primer would have been better because that's what I ended up doing here with an airbrush, but oh well. Next came a coat of teal blue, also applied by airbrush, and once that was done, it was on to the finer painting details. I should probably also note here that while I'm using acrylic paints, I did recently purchase a mixed set of Vallejo model paints. These give much better coverage than craft paint when it comes to smooth plastic surfaces, though I'll probably be sticking with my craft paints for paper, wood, and other more porous surfaces. For added visual interest, I knew I wanted some slick racing stripes on the body of the speeder, which I achieved by first cutting thin strips of masking tape and then building out the pattern I wanted piece by piece. As mentioned at the outset of this video, the female pilot of the ship is named Rai Jalid. Born blind, she was a natural at navigating her surroundings by feel and sound, and showed a predisposition for flying when, at the age of five, she took over the helm of her father's egg trawler when he was knocked unconscious on a fishing trip. She safely brought the vessel, her father, and their egg haul back to the harbor that day, and it wasn't long before she had a ship of her own. At only 19 years of age, she holds the record for nearly half of the cave runs in this part of Ankara. The teal, red, and white colors of her speeder are taken from her clan's crest, with the characters In Hisat Ifke painted on the hull. May the Hisat rest peacefully. But what is a Hisat? To age and weather Rai's speeder, I first sanded away the teal layer, exposing the darker paint beneath. And this was pretty tricky since going too far here would result in the red plastic showing through, which totally didn't happen, let's look at something else. I then gave the whole thing a nice black wash for a grimy finish, then brushed on some chalky pastel dust for a rusty look. The reason I didn't use my usual method of baking soda and brown paint here was that at this scale it would have looked too chunky, so I needed something finer. Rye was painted last, and boy did these new miniature paints make this an absolute joy to accomplish. This would have taken way more layers with craft paint, and ended up looking a lot more globby and gross. A final black wash helped to bring some of those finer details to life. And now, on to the Hisat. The Hisat, which literally means one which crawls, is a feared cave-dwelling creature. While its diet doesn't typically consist of human flesh, it'll make an exception if hungry enough. Hisat subsist primarily on the porca eggs found in cave rivers like the one we're about to pour, making this particular racing route an especially dangerous one. Once the wire armature was built, I covered each segment in a thin layer of polymer clay and baked not in the oven but using my heat gun. And this is where things got interesting, because I discovered that by overheating the clay, tiny bubbles formed and hardened, leading to a bumpy texture not unlike the protrusions found on crabs and lobsters. With the rest of the claw baked traditionally, I added the surface layer, blending the bits that needed blending and wrinkling the bits that needed wrinkles. I then added on some hard armor-like plates to the skin since this is an underground creature that can survive cave-ins and is constantly scraping against hard stone. And because this is a digging creature, it needed claws, which I used translucent clay for. Once it was cured, using the heat gun for the bumpy bits and an oven for the rest, I was ready to paint. I went for a palish brownish reddish color for the base, then covered that in a series of washes to give some depth to an otherwise flat paint job. 
I started with a red wash, then progressed to a purple one, and then hit it with a khaki dry brushing to highlight the raised texture. The final step here was just a bit of red in the knuckles and fingertips, where the skin would be much thinner and the red of the blood vessels within would show through. And hey, you remember those weird indentations I made in the cave floor? Well, it was time to revisit them to turn this whole cavern into a nesting ground full of unhatched porca eggs. To craft said eggs, I combined a few brown and reddish polymer clay strings and rolled them into balls about yay big. I then gracefully, yeah, I, I dumped them into this incubator and baked them. I then covered all those amniotic sacs in a thin layer of translucent clay and baked a second time. And I was pretty proud of how these turned out. I mean, come on, aren't these just the cutest little alien egg sacs that may or may not hatch into something that would eat you? Using tweezers and some old white glue, I then set each of the eggs into their own snuggly little nook. Now, I wanted some sort of giant explosion of dust and rock from the direction where the hisat was coming, as if it were bursting through the cave walls to get to the speeder, so I first made these little dust pillars with clear acrylic rods and cotton. I then used this sheet of acrylic to mark out the places the dust pillars would be jutting from, along with a spot for the hisat's clawed arm. Using hot glue, I attached the arm first. Then I stuck in the pillars, which I'd airbrushed off camera, along with some dust clouds, and then I glued the whole thing in place and let it sit overnight. The next day, I airbrushed on some paint to the back of the acrylic sheet to hide the lighting source and also add more color to the light, and then it was time to make sure all those seams were sealed tight to prevent resin leaks. This was impossible to film properly, but this is me applying some UV resin via pipette, then curing. Then came the tiny acrylic rods to suspend Rai's speeder in midair. This was also held in place with UV resin, which we can actually see this time. Then the resin dam was glued into place, and I mixed up the two-part epoxy resin with literally just this one drop of paint. And I learned something interesting from this resin pour. When popping bubbles with your blowtorch, be careful not to heat it up too much, which can cause an exothermic reaction, causing the resin to superheat and cure much too quickly. In the future, I'll only use the blowtorch every 10 to 15 minutes and probably open the windows and keep the fans on to lower the room temperature. But although this result wasn't exactly what I was after, it simply made the water look like it was flowing quickly, which wasn't a total disappointment. After detaching the dam and doing some minor repairs to the resin, I dabbed on this Woodland Scenics water effect. This tacky substance dries clear, just like resin, and is used for creating ripples and waves in water. While that was still drying, I built the signature Beyond the Blight wooden plank siding, painted the exterior, and then came back on the final day for some additional effects on the cave river like this white paint for a choppy water effect. I made a few more eggs too, since tragically the resin mishap had hidden the many, many eggs I had laid on the river floor. And finally I stained the planks, and that was that. In spite of her blindness, Rai Jalid navigated this cavern expertly, using her tuned ear sighting skills to avoid its many dangers, including a hisat. She won this race, by the way, bringing additional honor to her clan and further solidifying her legendary status among the Unders. Well, this build was a joy to share with you all, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. Let me know what you thought in the comments, and if this build sparked your own creative juices, be sure to tell me. I was tickled when one of my viewers, Hannah G, recently drew this awesome fan art of her rendition of one of the Unders. Go check out a link to her drawing tutorial in the comments. And as always, a huge shout out to my lovely patrons who are helping me fund these projects. And you know, if that's something you want to do too, there's, there's always room for more. Just saying. Until next time, this is Gamey Built. Over and out.